And so while we know from these experiments that aging can actually be separated from longevity, and longevity is something that has evolved and aging has not, people have attempted to connect um, aging and the senescence associated with it to some form of um, evolution um, and some type of selection, right? Because there has to be some explanation for how genes or how things that are harmful to an individual as it ages cannot be like removed from the population immediately. And so one of these sort of theories on how sort of the negative effects of aging have remained and kind of come to being is this idea of antagonistic pleiotropy, which was proposed by G.C. Williams. And pleiotropy is kind of simply where one gene controls multiple phenotypes. And so you can see the single gene here, and it has multiple traits that it confers or multiple phenotypic outputs. So one gene, many phenotypes. And in the case of aging, um, what G.C. Williams argued is that there's this antagonistic pleiotropy, where the single gene um, that has multiple phenotypes has one good phenotype that helps enhance reproductive fitness, and then one of the negative phenotypes is something that could contribute to a harmful effect of aging later in life. And so what Williams argued is that genes that contribute to extending um, or to con contribute to fitness and survival will be selected for, even though they might be negative or harmful later in life. And sort of that this good contribution to increasing fitness and reproduction is so good uh, that it's worth it for the organism to keep those genes around in the gene pool, um, even though they might not be as great later. <laughs> And this is um, supported by that idea that there's different selection pressures at different stages of life, and that there's a higher force of natural selection early, pre-reproduction, and then once reproduction happens, the forces of natural selection decrease over time. And so the genes that contribute to fitness and this positive kind of effect on it are selected for in that time of high selection pressure and then as selection pressure decreases, those harmful phenotypes um, are not really selected against. And one example of this that's observed in humans is uh, testosterone production. And so there is a gene that contributes to testosterone production in males, and testosterone is obviously necessary for sexual reproduction and having a uh, levels of testosterone that are adequate can contribute to fitness and um, help those males reproduce and pass their genes on to the next generation. And this is really important, right? This is testosterone is essential for this reproductive fitness. Um, but unfortunately, later in life, um, as males age, high testosterone production can actually lead to some forms of prostate cancer. And so there's this idea of antagonistic pleiotropy here with a gene for testosterone, where there's one gene making testosterone that helps with reproductive fitness early and then can lead to cancer later on. And because there's no natural selection to act later in life, um, this gene and its expression kind of remains the same and ultimately is continually selected for in a population. And in addition to antagonistic pleiotropy, in the 80s, Thomas Kirkwood developed a theory kind of based on the trade-off hypothesis that Weissman originally um, adopted many years before, on this, based on this um, idea that organisms are competing constantly for limited resources, and that only the ones that are most efficient will be able to survive. <laughs> and that is the ones that can use those resources basically the best, right? And they're most efficient at using these limited resources. And Kirkwood's theory is deemed the disposable soma theory or the disposable body theory because he argued that the best use of those limited resources is to give them to the germline. And so <clears throat> basically give them to their germline so that you can um, pass on your genes via reproduction and the soma, or the body, cells need just enough resources to get by. 
And in this case, any resources given to the germline would mainly be used to help maintain the integrity of the DNA. You don't want to pass on mutations through the germline, and so DNA repair mechanisms will get a lot of resources according to the disposable soma theory. And it's most efficient and kind of the best case scenario for an organism to donate those resources to maintaining their DNA. <coughs> and this is all, um, it's important that an organism balances the resources that's given to the germline and to the soma. Because you can't give all of the resources to the germline or there won't be enough for the body to survive long enough to grow and reproduce um, and basically live long enough for the germline to have any effect. But you can't give all of the resources to the soma or you run the risk of <coughs> passing on uh, potentially damaged or mutated DNA to the next generation. And so what the disposable soma theory would argue is that the organism that has kind of like the perfect balance between resources given to the soma and resources given to the germline is going to be the most successful organism.